Well, welcome to another episode of Frame of Reference, uh, Profiles in Leadership. And uh, today I have another opportunity to interview someone that I have never talked with before. And that is always exciting because it means I honestly learn more that way than I do with people that I've talked to multiple times because you get in kind of a rut of asking the same old, same old. And today is a topic, too, that I've never had uh, anyone with a specific uh, background in this. I've, I, if you've looked at the show before, we've talked with Kurt Miney and uh, you know other current uh, conservationists, Charlie Luthen, over the years. Um, and, and certainly both of those gentlemen have a lot of interest in water and the, uh, the conservation of the same. But uh, my guest today is Riggs Eckleberry, and he is a nationally re- re- renowned, sorry, I can't say words today, Let's start over with that one. Riggs Eckleberry is a nat- nationally renowned entrepreneur uh, dedicated to revolutioning, revolutionizing. I just should give up talking, and, and Riggs, you can do it all, okay? Uh, revolutionizing the water industry, which has reached a critical breaking point in recent years, despite being essential to the planet's sur- survival. So I think we could say, if you don't know about Riggs Eckleberry, you're not all wet, because uh, you should know, oh. isn't that, huh? Huh? Do you like, th- I've been thinking about that one for a ri- while, Riggs. So he is also qualified to bring change to an outdated and overrun industry, which I want to find out more about that. But thank you, Riggs, for taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, talk with me today. I really appreciate it. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. So uh, Riggs, as you know, we talked a little bit beforehand about the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, way that I like to do my modus operandi, if you will. Uh, and we like to start out always with a thing called My Favorite Things. One of these days I'll get the rights to that sh- song and we can overlay Julie Andrews doing a wonderful rendition of it. Uh, they, I don't have enough money for that quite yet, but we'll get there someday, I'm sure. Anyway, so we'll, I'm just going to throw out some things there. It's very Rorschachian. Uh, you just say whatever comes to your mind first. And if you have to struggle a little bit to think, that's even better. <laughs> so... <laughs> Because <laughs> it means you're digging deep. I always like that. So let's start with something easy. All right. How about a favorite color? It's blue. Um, n- not only do I have I am I stuck with wearing blue because of at least my eyes used to be blue. I don't know if they are anymore. Um, <laughs> but also, I just love the ocean, and um, you know, spent many years as a both an amateur and professional sailor, and um, you know. Uh, to me, the water, as you know, I, I'm a big skier, sailor. I, I love water, so I would say blue. Okay, well, that's consistent, if nothing else, right? So, how about a favorite book besides yours? You can't, you can't use one of yours. That's just too self-serving. So, well, I have to say the one that I that I that I try to you know live by is uh, called Inside the Tornado, and um, that is a book that was a successor to an equally famous uh, book called um, Crossing the Chasm. Now, um, the the whole idea of Inside the Tornado by Jeffrey Moore, a just an amazing, amazing uh, book, is that it, it characterizes uh, the high-tech product life cycle, which starts at the very beginning with the crazies, the people who actually use the Newton PDA, those people. <laughs> and then... And then it moves to the strategic buyer, the buyer that is trying to get a, an edge on the competition. And then it does this, um, it crosses this chasm, which is the big challenge to enter what's called the tornado, which is every adopts it, right? And then blow, and then it moves to a, to a um, sort of a, a conservative stage. And then the back end is the, is the skeptics who are always on, always their last. Now, um, it, I, I came up through high tech, uh, you know, starting in the 80s, and I, and I love it. I believe that everything is behaving like a high tech life cycle these days. So um, things are moving faster and faster all the time. And I came to the water industry as a high tech guy. Okay. Does that, you know, that concerns me sometimes that we are moving so tornadically, if you if that's a word, um, because with that 
that, as you say, the increasing uh, violence even of that whirlwind, um, we seem to, I don't know how to describe it except to say it seems like we lose some uh, critical things in that maelstrom. Um, you know, not the least of which is perhaps, you know, decency and civility, um, you know, because it, it is so quick. You have to make a decision now, 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 now. Um, and with that mentality, it's very difficult to take a, a pause and just enjoy the ocean, right? You know, to uh, to let yourself be steeped in the moment of, isn't this a wonderful world? And shouldn't we take care of some of these things? Do you, do you find that as a challenge? I think you're 100% right. Um, and... We are just in this constant um, spin cycle that, um, you know, some would say it was it's intentional to basically get us just to work all the time. Uh, but regardless, um, you're right. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, a, what, what I'm really getting at is uh, high tech techniques really are, are very, very good for disruption, right? Mm -hmm. What I found when I entered the water industry was an industry that was not prepared for change. They like everything's fine. We're gonna, you know, it's a similar attitude to the one you most people have with the water coming out of their faucet or flushing out of the toilet, which is everything's fine. But it wasn't, and so um, there was. It's an industry that's very hard to change, um, and in many ways, rightfully so because they have a public health mission and so forth. Sure. But I had to go and find. What would you know? What was the the point of leverage to make the fulcrum to make this this change happen? And um, that's where my knowledge of disruptive marketing uh, gained through ten years of um, going up. At one point, I went from being an entrepreneur to being in the corporate space, and for ten years, I basically worked my way up to being what I consider you know a good C level executive. And it was all about how can I break the existing situation, whether it's we're struggling with, with old, outdated, bad code, or are we, um, do we have a great product, but nobody knows about it, or any variety of things. So I think that effective disruption is a good thing. And I, it strikes me, too, that in uh, Wisconsin, where I live, we've had a, a number of tornadoes. <laughs> so, And uh, even throughout the, the rest of the United States, you find that that tornado comes through, it's very disruptive, and yet the towns that choose to rebuild, um, they often times come back stronger. Um, they come back having learned some important lessons about not only how to build things better, but uh, find out which things really, really matter in life. Um, That's very true. So very true. perhaps there's a, an analogy there. Not that I want to live through a tornado. I'm not saying that. It's just, uh, but you're right. Disruptions are oftentimes the best way of learning too. What about, how about a favorite quote? Uh, hopefully that's easy. Well, I, I, um, I think this is something that has uh, stood the test of time for me. Uh, and I, I had this uh, as a young man in my wallet for years, which is, um, um, the author of The Little Prince uh, wrote this, Il n'est qu'un luxe véritable et c'est celui des relations humaines. There's but one true wealth and it is human relations, right? And um, Antoine de Saint-Exupéry wrote that in a book called Terre des Hommes, Land of Men. And what I think, um, that's the point. Essentially, every, every, you know, everything that we're doing is um, about that. The very good quote by Warren Buffett that I just um, love, and that is, I've never known anybody that was basically kind that died without friends. I've known plenty of people with money who died without friends, including their family. So, you know, pursuit of money is great. Pursuit of, uh, you know, paying attention to lifestyle and what I'm wearing, and all, that's all great. But the real magic, I believe, is what we're doing right here, right? That's, that's it. And everything else is kind of besides the point. Even if it is water and the source of life, it does come back to human relationships. It's interesting you picked that book too, because my brother years ago gave me a copy of The Little Prince. And uh, I should find that because I remember he wrote something in the uh, preface to it of, you know, sharing it with me because he had found that it, it 
served him well during his life and hope that it would do the same for me. And, you know, Saint Exupéry is just a, you know, wonderfully charming author. And uh, I forget who did the illustrations for that, but, you know, managed to capture the simplistic beauty uh, very, very well. So reminds me of Winnie the Pooh. So (laughs) kind of along Mm -hmm. that line, right? Um, How about, uh, do you have a favorite uh, food? Uh, everyone has a favorite food, I hope. So, well, it depends the favorite food to eat or to make. Uh, right? Either you choose. You're the guest. That's the difference. I over the years evolved a real talent with risotto, and the reason I like risotto is it's a it's a dish that you build over time, and you can often do it with friends around, and they're watching you build this risotto, and then they're going to eat it. Uh, unfortunately. Uh, you know, a few months ago, I, I went into a keto diet, <laughs> so no more rice. And so um, right now, uh, I'm in lo- wait, last night, my wife and I had a, a true grass-fed ribeye that was done on the barbecue, and it was amazing. Uh, oh, really good, clean food like that. Now, um, another great dish that I love is osobuco. Okay. Kill me now. That is the best. Okay. The best. I'll have to try that. That's that's not something I have had. Although the ribeye steak thing, I am right with you on that one. So there's uh, nothing like a steak on a grill to make a day happy. I usually require that for my birthday and or Father's Day or both. So <laughs> the family doesn't even have to ask anymore, Dad, what do you want? Uh, that, that's just so, so what kind of steak do you want, Dad? Um, so how about last question? How about is there a favorite place that you like to go to when you just need to kind of clear your head? A favorite thing? You, it may be a thing that you do to an activity, um, but that just is a centering thing for you. Or place. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, yeah, I would say that the most centering thing to do is to sit down. For my wife and I both work very hard. She's uh, she has a school, um, but to eat, to sit down and have dinner together, and just just quietly talk um, about whatever. Um, that that to me just recharges me tremendously. Why? I had a friend that just was talking about that, that he is a psychiatrist and he had said that um, we were kind of both reflecting on our lives and we're both in our 60s and thinking about, you know, all the things that when we first knew each other, we wish we would have done or that we saw ourselves potentially doing. And both of us came to the same realization that, you know, all of those dreams that you have when you're young don't really match up to the little things that happen over the course of your life that really impact us that really help to form who we are uh and that i thought that was really it was interesting that he and i had come to that same realization um and, it, well, it, and, and i think that you, you gotta find value in the small things because that's most of life right yeah yeah very much so and, uh, so you know but if you want to ask know where physically i i go to unwind is i'm an avid skier okay and uh been that way for years and years in fact for my 40th birthday, I went and ski bummed. I dropped my entire career, which at the time was I was working in film. And people who were coming going up the gondola while I was in my chef's uniform at Keystone, and they find out that I'd taken a break from film, they go, No, don't do it. You gotta go back right away. You're looking you lose it all. But I it was a blowout winter for me. And um, these days, because eventually, you know. You ski, you ski, you ski, you ski. Well, what else do you do? Well, you start to tr- teach kids. And so my wife's school kids go with us to the mountains uh, twice, usually once or twice a year. And I love being the guy who, t- come on, let me show you how to do a double black diamond. And we survive it. That's cool. <laughs> Yeah, you're leaving a legacy, right? Of people that got turned on to skiing by your passion for it. That is, that is, no matter what the domain is, that's a wonderful thing. So, Riggs, you know, I have to say too, Riggs, Eckleberry, it sounds like we should be talking in a British accent. So today, I have Riggs Eckleberry with me, Professor Riggs Eckleberry. Where did that name come from? I have to know. Is that a, a nickname or was it a shortened version of a longer name? Riggs alone. My full name is Tenor, T-E-N-E-R, okay. Riggs, Eckleberry, Jr. Okay. 
And so my dad was known as tenor and I was known as Riggs. Okay. Right. So um, when, when I'm usually when I deal with uh, officialdom and with, you know, the hospitals or whatever they call it, uh, hello, tenor. And I go, who's, who's that? <laughs> uh, my, my, dad, my dad passed away a few years ago. So I no longer bother with the junior. Um, but what they are is they're a family name. So tenor was a family name from um, France uh, and through via, via um, Ireland. And then Riggs, you're right, was an English is is an English family name that was in the family. Echoberry is German. Okay. Um, it comes from South Germany. Okay. So and and then there's a whole other side, which is my mother's side, which is um, you know from Cuba and Spain and Colombia, which is a whole other world. Okay. Um, so you know I'm a Stir it up. I'm a good mix. Wow. So you have Irish, German, and French in your name. That happens to be the three nationalities that I have in my actual genetic background. My dad dad was full French. Mom was half French, half, uh, a quarter German, and a quarter Irish. So she always used to think of herself as pure Irish, though, and that was always a point of contention. <laughs> you know, the old saying, you know, of, you know, there are only two types of people in the world, those that are Irish and those that wish they were. And I'd say, yeah, mom, there's also those that are glad they ain't so but she didn't like that too much there's a, there's a joke about um, um you know vermonters this this, this uh, family moves to vermont from new york and and um after a winter of being there and living through the snow and all so forth the the, the wife says to, is talking to a local and says well i guess we're real vermonters and the guy says well my my cat had her kittens in the oven, but that does not make them muffins. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we always say, th too, that, you know, you can put yourself in a garage and call yourself a car, but that doesn't make you a car. So, okay. but uh, anywho... So, um, Riggs, I, I am fascinated about the the work that you have ended up doing, and I, we talked a little bit before we even started the the actual recording about my coming into this and realizing, you know, to my own shame, that one of the issues I think we have, and you know, at least I personally have with the, the topic of water, is that it it is so neglected because we have so much of it. And yet, you know, if you go out to Arizona or, you know, California or places where they're struggling and, you know, wringing the last bits of the Colorado River out, you know, to, to get by um, and, you know, struggling because they can't have their lawns be as green as they would love to them to be, you know, whatever the, the crisis of the day is with water, you know, I, 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 I'm kind of a, in a whole different world because I grew up three blocks from Lake Michigan in Milwaukee. And, you know, we, we never thought too much about it because there was plenty of it there that, you know, we just, at that time, just scooped it up from the lake and did a little bit of water treatment and it was fine. Um, and yet it is so critical, uh, you know, the so critical that you cannot live, you know, you can go months or more over a month without food, but you can't go more than three, four days without water. So why do you think that is? Why are we so reluctant to grab a hold of the preciousness of water and use it as I, I want to say sacredly as we ought. Um, Cause it is, it's a, you know, a gift that uh, the farmers that I know in our community talk about, you know, never curse the rain because they, they remember times when they go through severe droughts and you know, what impact that has not only on their livelihood, but on everything around them. Um, and yet we're like, ah, oh, rainy day. Blah, blah, blah. Um, I, I, where is that coming from? Have you looked at the psychology or the spirituality of that? Is that what drove you into this? Is somebody has to make a difference and make this better? Well, how I got into it was completely ass backwards because, um, I, you know, in brief, my, my, my story was that, as I said, I, I, and finally got into the corporate world. And 10 years later, I was, I was, I felt I was qualified to become a CEO, having also been in, you know, prior to that, a ship captain and a business owner, blah, blah, blah. And this fund agreed with me, but they said, uh, we're not doing high tech anymore. We're doing green. And we think algae is the next big thing for biofuels. And so we launched a company originally called Origin Oil, which I mean, you know, algae, it's, Petroleum doesn't come from dinosaurs. It comes from algae. As not, there are not enough dinosaurs out there to make all that 
fossil fuel. Um, so the the idea of algae for biofuel was so powerful that I found myself, you know, getting tremendous media coverage and I was on TV a lot and so forth. Um, the problem is that uh, fracking came along and depressed the price of oil so much that it just wasn't viable to run a company making biofuel at $120 a barrel um, when oil was at 40 or 50. So we pivoted into water as more of a like, well, what can we do with our technology, which is an extraction technology? And we figured out, okay, you know, um, sewage, you know, um, that works. And so we went with that um, more as, as a, you know, alternate application for the tech that we had. And, um, and that's when we learned that water is, a, is it's, its own thing. Now, why? Well, the main thing, it's a, it's a problem of, I think it's a problem of generations of infrastructure. Um, let's take, for example, um, phones, right? Uh, Africa uh, never bothered to go to landlines. It just went straight to cell phones. Um, and in a way, America, uh, our adoption of, of broadband and so forth was held up by having landlines, right? So you held up by your legacy infrastructure. Similarly, we have an energy grid that only talks one way. It just pushes it out like a fire hose. It does not, it does not uh, interrogate the end user like, um, would you like it differently or whatever? No, nothing like that. Um, so we're finding ourselves having to create all kinds of alternative um, uh, structures like, like the ring system and so forth to try and get smarter about things. <clears throat> Similarly, in water, uh, America built its water system so long ago uh, you know, much of it was built in the 1800s, late 1800s, that we can't, we kind of have it. Now, the problem is, of course, that populations grow and populations move, right? For example, right now, there's a giant boom going on in North Texas of people having moved there. And uh, between Dallas and the Oklahoma border, it's boom town. And we have a bunch of clients that are they are um, implementing our decentralized water system as a way to not have to connect to sewage because the utilities have not kept up with the boom. And here's the problem. Uh, behind me is Pinellas County, Florida, which is one of the most populated counties in Florida. Where are you going to put the, the water sewage system? Not going to happen. Used to be you could do a bunch of landfill in the water and build on that, but that's an environmental issue. So there's all kinds of reasons why Central utilities don't get built, uh, even aside from the fact that the existing utilities are suffering from lack of maintenance and upgrade. So <laughs> long story short is um, it's making sense more and more to for industry to have its own water treatment. Um, there's other important trends. For example, deglobalization is causing a lot of businesses to relocate their uh, manufacturing in places like South Texas, Northern Mexico, et cetera. And that is starting to happen so fast that again, there's no time to build a central utility. So you have an integrated water treatment system that comes automatically with the brand new factory. And that's the new, new thing. The new, new thing is to for industry and agriculture to take care of their own water because 90% of all water demand is by industry and agriculture. That means the 10%, which is you and me, get short shrift. We're, they're basically, these industrial agriculture users are just, you know, in a way suffocating the system. And if we can pull them off the central system under their own, which they're delighted to do once they understand the benefits, including recycling and uh, predictable um, water rate increases and whatever, um, that we then enable the infrastructure to serve the people better. And I, I think I get very hot under the collar about this because because of the heavy load by uh, the business users, um, the the ten percent really don't get get the water they need. Also, they get harassed a lot about shorter showers, but frankly, they're not the big difference, right? Mm -hmm. the, the big difference is on the ninety percent side. Um, in Ireland, water is free. Well, water should be free, and it can be if industry takes care of its own water treatment. Isn't that interesting too? It's it's uh, like a lot of the renewable energy 
you know, arguments that you know, we need to do more to conserve, 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 when, you know, even if everyone were conserving at 100% or close to 100% capacity or capability, um, it still makes a relatively minor dent in the whole scheme of things, because as you say, you know, industries oftentimes are such huge contributors to the problem. Um, and you know what, it, it strikes me that the thing that always, uh, gets in the way is it has to make business sense for a business to engage in something like you're talking about, you know, it, taking sure. care of their own water needs. Well, until they see a, a, you know, a net gain for that on the bottom line, or they see a regulation that's going to be so punitive that it, you know, it, it's to their advantage to get in line and do the thing that's either being regulated or, you know, is a great, you know, revenue stream. It just doesn't happen. Do you think there are ways to, to get around that? I mean, is it just a matter of educating and waiting for CEOs with a conscience <laughs> or, or is it, you know, simpler than that? I mean, I hate punitive situations, but sometimes it seems like that's the only thing that makes people or businesses wake up and, you know, smell the coffee or the water if it were. So. Well, let's go back to that, um, the tornado uh, life cycle, which again, starts with the early, super early adopters moves into the strategic buyers, people who are trying to, to, um, we, we have, uh, for example, those housing developments in North Texas are using standalone uh, sewage treatment as a competitive advantage, right? They are moving ahead of their competitors because they don't have to put in a sewage line to a utility that won't even accept it. So that's the stage where things are at. And then before that tornado, there's something, there's something called the chasm. Now, that chasm, how in, in that book, Inside the Tornado, what gets... Um, you have to figure out something that's going to cross the chasm. And in our case, what we've learned is that many, many of these users, yeah, they have a problem with, um, you know, permitting, uh, you know, um, penalties and fines and so forth, but they're living with them because they're looking at a major capital expense to solve the problem. And so our invention is two, for, two part. Number one is uh, Modular Water Systems, which is the company we built since 2018 that that had that downsized the utility scale to these plug and play modules that can go right into businesses. Number one, number two is a uh, concept called water on demand, which is works a lot like um, oil well partnerships in that you can bring regular investors to invest in a bundle of properties with their royalties secured by um, you know a, a, a seizure rights on the assets and. Uh, ultimately, potentially generating genera uh, generational wealth, just like the oil industry, but it's water. Now, with that money, we then offer the customer, like, don't pay for the machine. It will remain ours. It will be on your site, but it will be our machine. And you just pay on the meter like you're accustomed to. And we also take care of the maintenance. In other words, it's, 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 um, it takes the problem completely away. And that right now... The, the first part, the technology part, has been booming. So these are people, uh, businesses that uh, have managed to deal with the financial issue, but they are buying into, you know, their housing development, their, 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 um, uh, these, for example, um, you know, um, rest stops on the highway, uh, all, all these detached applications, RV campgrounds, and so forth, mobile home parks. There's a variety of these that are very, very. Um, clearly need um, their own tr water treatment. And then there are the big, big water users, which are um, pharma, um, chip manufacturing, um, energy, alternative and regular energy, and food and beverage. Those are the big four. And they are now um, doing their own water treatment increasingly because, for example, a, a chip fab has to stop if there's a single hair in the water. It's over. The whole thing stops. So they increasingly are just doing, we'll just do our own water. And in fact, um, there's a recent unicorn that was created in our water industry that came out of MIT and was funded by some very high-end um, uh, you know, VCs that targets those four major users as being the, the low-hanging fruit. And they're not even bothering to supply financial help. They're just saying, here, uh, you're you're a pharmaceutical company, you don't need financial help. So though there, there's certain types of users that are naturals, 
that we are already in a huge, you know, we tripled our business year over year between 21 and 22. So we're, we're, we're rocking with that. But then we want to really take off with that. Don't worry. It's just a service contract type uh, arrangement and get away from the capital expense. Okay. Now, is that related to, you've also formed, as I understand, it's a, it's a, a type of cryptocurrency that also kind of supports the management, if you, if you will, if I'm understanding it correctly, of water assets in a way that is, uh, allows people to, you know, see water in the big picture and be able to help, uh, you know, folks in Wisconsin can help people in Alabama rectify a, a water situation that, you know, uh, they can't necessarily address it completely on their own because there just aren't the resources available to do that. Uh, how does that work? Well, we envisioned, and what we did is, is it's really um, in the lab and because we just got to do one thing at a time. But the idea is once we start paying those dividends to those investors to then package them as a digital bond coupon. And so now what's great about it is that um, you, you, you've got this digital bond coupon. You can, you can easily transfer it. It becomes a market and eventually creates a, a water marketplace that doesn't exist today. Um, because this is something I learned in 2018 when I first started experimenting with crypto, is that water does not have a clear, defined value. It, the, the price for water varies from all over the place, right? Um, depending on availability. And so, um, but when we do water on demand, people are paying by the gallon, and it's pretty much similar. They're paying pretty much the same amount um, across the boards. And so now you have every gallon monetized and then a dividend being paid on that production. And that becomes something that becomes a, you know, a fungible um, token. And eventually uh, it can be, you know, a digital bond market. We have put that into the, on the roadmap kind of out there because what's going on is we're, we're building essentially a, a three-part business here. The first part is this funding of these, uh, this equipment using the master, uh, well-known master limited partnership model from the oil industry. Uh, the middle of the third, the, the three is um, the technology, the modular water technology. And the third is this um, managing a service network where payment only occurs upon performance. And um, putting together those three is enough of a challenge for now. Okay. Now, once we have it mature, then we might look at, at, um, at tokenizing the, the payouts, which is an interesting idea. Um, but the other even more interesting idea is, is how to expand water on demand. Once we've figured out how to do this for the North American region and we've got some penetration, I want to then take it and replicate it in other regions, such as the Middle East. Um, so have a partner in Dubai or wherever in the Middle East um, who then creates a water on demand network there partner in Singapore who does it for the Malaysian Peninsula, et cetera. And so we can have um, a replication model where partners take what we do here and copy it, and we now get a network effect. And that, I think, is how we change water in the world. Because India, for example, has no water infrastructure whatsoever. Now, they're, they're spending you know, gigantic amount, amounts of money uh, way, way up in, the, in Nepal on the hydrology because they got to do something about all that water uh, up way way up high but meanwhile there's, there's people in in sewage pipes that are dying in, in uh, New Delhi um, because it's just horrendously uh, backward and what you're not going to do is build a you know a bunch of billion dollar water utilities what you'll do is do a lot of self-treatment by industry agriculture and eventually by People's homes, their apartment buildings, their homes, et cetera. And so decentralizing the problem, distributed water treatment is a great idea. Now, I'm not talking about incoming water. I believe that the municipalities need to continue to provide our incoming water. I don't think that's something we want to really disrupt. I'm talking about that water being made clean again, recycled, which we don't do at all, and then you know safely returned to the city or put in the ground to recharge the aquifer. That's the model. And um, it's happening that, you know, Israel recycles 90 percent of its water. Why don't we? Well, there's a lot of good reasons why. Um, but the reason we're not going to do it by persuading 
Um, in San Diego, they've been trying to do this thing that was dubbed toilet to tap, which is a terrible word. Um, and toilet to tap became um, something that was a, a municipal, it was a, a county of San Diego went after this, um, wanted to do it to recycle their water. And they were frankly just stopped in their tracks because of popular uh, dislike for the concept. So don't even try essentially, let people do it wherever they are. Right. Well, it's interesting when you talk about things like toilet to tap, too, because that that's what the astronauts are doing every day up in the ISS. Um, you know, and it seems to me that's always been a, a conundrum as to, well, if it's good enough for the astronauts, why can't we market that in a way that gets people to embrace it like they did Tang back in the 60s? You know, it's just, uh, it, it's, uh, I, I guess we just can't get away from the fact that, yeah, but this was someone's urine, you know, well, yeah, but it's not anymore. <laughs> so, uh, and if it solves a problem, I mean, you're talking about the people that are moving into uh, to, uh, northern Texas. Here they come into an area that has an obvious, just look around the train, has an obvious water deficiency. And yet the uh, financial incentives, whatever, are such that, well, that's where the jobs are and they're good jobs and we can make good money doing it. Um, and yet there's no gatekeeper there to say, well, wait a minute, we need to have the infrastructure to allow those people in. Otherwise, as you know, like letting 60,000 people into a 25,000 person stadium, you just, you, you know, it's not going to work successfully. Right. So is there a, no, I'm not sure where I'm going with this question, but how, is there an educational process you think we need to get through too? It's an infrastructure. It's an infrastructure. You just do the infrastructure just like cell phones, right? Just bypass the whole central infrastructure and make it at uh, all they needed was cell phone towers and phones. And that was that end of story, right? So we can do that with water. In other words, let people have their own water systems. You know, we do at a brewery, it'll be, it'll be tucked away in a corner of the brewery and it takes care of all their water treatment, you know, and they can reuse the water for washdowns. They don't have to make beer with it, but sure. even without making beer, they can still recycle 50% of the water. And that's a big win. So, um, you know, the definitely, we have adoption going on of, you know, decentralized or distributed water treatment. That's happening. Um, you know, that again, you know, um, uh, there is a uh, tremendous trend because of deglobalization of repatriation, of reshoring of um, American industry back to North America. And uh, Peter, Peter Zihan, who uh, is a wonderful uh, thinker, has predicted that there's going to be an enormous manufacturing boom in America as it all comes back. Now, when those when these come back and they've already begun to, again, who takes care of the water? And if you're if you go to Mexico, you'll find that nobody nobody is treating that sewage. Well, that that is not going to work for American companies operating in Mexico because they they are stuck with their own. Um, standards that they have to meet for their own, um, you know, um, shareholders and so forth. So, okay. um, and, reg and regulatory requirements. So, um, what is driving water quality improvement in Mexico is not the Mexicans. It is the American companies that have to meet their, uh, you know, ESG, D, uh, ESG type requirements or, um, you know, eat, uh, corporate standards that are set back home. So, we're, we are going to see a lot of that happen, and that is a vast trend. Now, what we're saying is, look, this trend is happening. You're going to have um, self-contained water treatment with these factories and with the housing developments that will spring up as well and all that. And so use a compact technology, which is what we have, and use a financing technology to make it pay per gallon so people don't even think about the capital. And that is why we are so excited about what we've built and, um, we, you know, this idea of water as a service is not a new idea. There's, there's companies that do it, but you can't invest in them. They are VC owned or they're um, operated for, in the case of uh, one company uh, by Morgan Stanley Infrastructure Partners. So um, you, can, you don't have access, but Origin Clear with our water on demand um, uh, offering, we are welcoming regular investors. You just go to originclear.com, press the invest now button, and they're up and running. That 
is unique, and we plan to keep that sort of water as the people's asset uh, mentality. Um, you know, back in 21, the, the, one, of, one of the water industry execs wrote in Forbes Council, as a, as a contributor, he wrote, the next trillionaire is going to be in water. The first trillionaire is going to be in water. We say, no, we don't want one trillionaire. We want millions of millionaires, right? So we'd rather democratize this this. Um, this asset is just now coming out from government monopoly and is now starting to crank up. Water tech is becoming hot. Well, let's let regular investors have a uh, crack at it. And we love those investors. They're super faithful. And um, they, I believe, it's like a, a political campaign taking a bunch of small contributions. You're more powerful than a campaign driven by one guy's wealth, for example. Right. Well, and it sounds like, too, there's this um, quality of stewardship involved mm -hmm. in that. In that, um, if if everyone is involved in the process of uh, use utilizing and uh, cultivating, maintaining water in responsible ways, uh, we all become much more careful about how we utilize it and what we do to continue its uh, health, if you will. Um, that, that strikes me as a real, uh, I, I really, uh, applaud you for getting into the forefront of helping people to understand this is all going back to the original question. This isn't something we can just whittle away or, you know, treat flippantly. It really is something that we all have a part in maintaining it so that, you know, everyone has the same access to life, um, that water provides for us. Right. Um, realistic though businesses need to have roi right so yes they'll do beneficial things but it, if it doesn't work financially they'll be like yeah i don't know about that yeah. and so the fact that they can recycle which saves on water rates that they in in this long-term service contract they have predictable water rate index you know inflation index as opposed to the craziness that's going on with water rates right now with this totally uncontrolled um these things and also the ability to, you know, it's, a, it's a very important that a business knows that it, uh, somebody's going to tell them, nobody can tell them, no, we'll, we won't take your water, right? Because that's going on right now. Municipalities are overloaded and they're saying, we can't take your dirty water. And businesses are going, well, what do I do with it now? And they're trucking it to the other county. This is happening all the time. Well, once you get your own system, no more dependency. Yeah. Doesn't worry. You can cut me off if you want to, because I'm already cut off myself. I have a friend that, you know, installed all renewable energy sources at his house. And uh, he, he fondly talks about the day that the utilities guy came over and was looking all around the house, you know, looking for a meter and he couldn't find it. And he waited long enough for the, the guy to, he would have figured it out eventually, but he came out and said, what are you looking for? And he said, well, your meter, you know, where's your meter? And he said, I, I don't have a meter. I'm all on my own. See ya. <laughs> so wow. was a great day. Wow. So Indeed. how about, um, you know, uh, the Biden infrastructure bill, as I understand it, had some uh, really key incentives built into it for water infrastructure. Do you think that is a, a uh, uh, you know, is that something we should as a re Republican or Democrat that people should be getting behind? Um, or is it is not sufficient enough? Do, is it just kind of a Band-Aid when uh, there's really much more serious surgery necessary? I'm sitting here on calculator looking at, uh, there we go. There's 120, it's a $1.2 trillion, right? Okay. Um, and I want to make sure I got another this is million, billion, trillion. Uh, I got a few too many digits. Okay. One point two trillion dollars is that was the uh, administration divided by um, fifty-five billion, which is what the proportion was water, right? And um, it goes in two thousand over two thousand times. So what water got was what one two thousand was literally you can have two thousand times water's share of that bill to get to that bill. People don't realize how much a trillion dollars is, right? So the point I'm making is that um, 55 billion was meaningless in, in the context of the water industry is falling behind by $100 billion every year. So the, the now, 
Was it helpful? Yes, because there's a big focus on lead remediation, which is vital, but it, it really did nothing for the infrastructure itself. And our theory is like, look, don't try and rebuild the infrastructure. It's going to take 30 years or take trillions of dollars. Instead, unburden it, unburden the infrastructure, take the load off by having that happen remotely. And that seems to me that, um, you know, for example, in um, Miami-Dade County, they, when they originally built that county, it was sprawl, they didn't plan it. And so they have over 100,000, um, you know, um, you know, uh, what do you call it? The, 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 sewer, the septic tanks. Okay. And those septic tanks are leaking and, you know, the water table is rising and it's all horrible. And so my, the Miami Day wants to spend $8 billion. Um, it's, they say six, but it'll be eight or more um, to send sewage lines out to each of the 100,000 uh, septic tanks. Well, why not just give them a rebate for just having a standalone black water system and then done. Right. Instead of tearing up the street and spending billions and 20 years. But of course, that's how they think. The central guys think central and they they also love to have the big, you know, um, contracts that go along with it and so forth. Sure. But, you know, at the end of the day, it makes a lot of sense for it to be um, decentralized and the technology is there. Well, it seems like um, I think it's the Gates Foundation, didn't they? They're doing similar um uh, projects in third world world countries trying to help them uh, get a system that will allow them to convert their sewage, which oftentimes is just the nearby brook or river, um, and be able to not only take care of that sewage and manage that better, but also be able to develop a, a clean water supply. Um, so it, it strikes me that that's almost uh, maybe that's the model we're l- working towards is here in Prairie to Sac, Wisconsin, we would have our own self-sufficiency in water supply and water treatment. Does that seem like a, a rational approach to this? Well, like I say, I don't mind communal water supply because that's, that's logical. I don't want to, I don't want every business to dig in its own well necessarily. Um, but we do need to have um, standalone water treatment And, you know, it's all very well that foundations are paying for things in Africa. But let's pay attention to what's going on in North America, for God's sake, right? We have real problems. Flint is only the tip of the iceberg. You know, there's some terrible problems throughout America that are not really being discussed with water quality. Uh, South Bend, which was a big manufacturing center, has tremendous uh, problems with the water strata. And we don't hear about it. If there's someone out there listening right now that just is not getting it, um, you know, that's just like, ah, it rains all the time, you know, or, you know, all this alarmist stuff about water. It, yeah, come on. Is there something you would point to or is there a question you would ask to get them to wake up and realize that we're talking life and death ultimately? I mean, at, at the end of the day, we have to figure this out because water – is not inexhaustible. Um, you know, yeah, we can desalinize oceans, but, you know, we're not going to solve the problem um, by not addressing it head on. What, what is that problem? Or what is the problem with people not embracing this? Let's do the easy stuff first. Desalination is expensive and it's an energy hawk, right? Look at, look at um, San Diego County. You know, the Colorado River water costs as little as $25 an acre foot. An acre foot is just to give you an idea, is um, roughly what a family of four can live on needs in a year. Okay, so that's neighbor foot. So, um, but that um, San Juan Capistrano desal plant is thirteen hundred and fifty dollars per acre foot. That's expensive stuff. So now your water bill skyrocket. Why not recycle? It's so easy. Do the recycling thing. You know, it's like you really want to make it expensive. And by the way, the Huntington Beach desal plant, after 10 years of development, got canceled because of because of uh, neighborly pressure. So that's not a solution. So start doing the, the things that make sense. And furthermore, 80% of all water in the world, of all sewage in the world, is not treated at all. It's dumped. Do you really want to live in sewage? Because that's what it's going to be eventually. Yeah, all I need to do is watch a couple of documentaries about that sort of thing, and I think that that woke me up. <laughs> I was already awakened somewhat, but 
Um, Riggs, we're raw out of time. I can't believe that the, an hour goes by as quickly as it does. Maybe that's our great resource that we need to figure out a way to recycle is time. So, yeah. uh, so, so we can spend more of it on the things that really matter, like discussions about stuff that will uh, kill us if we don't attend to them. Right. So uh, Riggs Eckleberry has been my guest. He's a nationally renowned entrepreneur dedicated to revolutionizing the water industry. We've gotten just the tip of that iceberg of what that looks like in a water revolution. But Riggs, I can't thank you enough for your time. I know you're a busy man. You've got lots of obviously big things going on. Um, I can only wish you the best of luck in those endeavors. And uh, I hope this little time together will help to wake some people up as well as maybe just make them think a little bit. That's always a good thing as well, right? And if they want to invest in the new asset water, just go to originclear.com, green button at the top, the top, invest now, and we'd welcome your investment. Yep. Well, get involved, right? It's a grassroots effort, if not a, a, a drip drop effort. I'm not sure what we would call it. So, <laughs> so well, thank you very much, Rob. Thank you. Take care. And thanks for listening to us on Frame of Reference.